So uh, good afternoon to everybody, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, many thanks uh, to my uh, good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Pablo Coimbra, for inviting me to join you in Neuro Club this afternoon. Uh, I hope you're staying safe. Uh, I hope you haven't been sick. Uh, we started our vaccinations uh, about two weeks ago in the hospital. We vaccinated uh, nearly 15,000 people that work uh, in our medical system. I got my first vaccine uh, about uh, 10 days ago, and I'm going to get my second dose uh, next Thursday. Nothing happened. I got a little bit of arm pain, and that was it. So don't be afraid of it. We got the Pfizer vaccine here, and uh, we're starting to vaccinate now the general public. Everybody over 75 years of age or older is now um, uh, eligible for the vaccine. So. Um, in this next 50 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about CSF leaks and uh, the so-called spontaneous intracranial hypotension. I have no disclosures. Uh, the lecture will be divided into three parts. First, we will talk about basic CSF physiology. Then we're going to talk about CSF leaks and the evaluation of CSF leaks at the level of the base of skull. And then the last third of the lecture will be about the clinical and imaging features of so-called SIH, which can stand for spontaneous intracranial hypotension or the syndrome of intracranial hypotensions, because many times it is not spontaneous, but it is a complication of medical procedures such as epidural anesthesia or another type of lumbar puncture. So what do we know about CSF physiology? The majority of it is produced by the cord plexus, but it's also produced by the ependema and the brain. We produce about half a milliliter of CSF every minute for a total volume of about 150 mLs of CSF contained within the cavities that house the central nervous system. About a third of it is located inside of the ventricles. And because we have a a larger production of CSF volume than the total volume, there is a turnover of at least three to five times of the total volume of CSF uh, throughout uh, the day. Now, where is it absorbed? Is it absorbed by the arachnoid villi? Maybe it is. There are two types of arachnoid villi, vascular and avascular, perhaps the vascular Pacuneum granulations do play a role in the resorption, but otherwise it is absorbed by the brain parenchyma and by the ependema. And some of it is absorbed by the lymphatics, particularly, you know, those lymphatics at the level of the base of the skull do absorb CSF that goes through the cranial nerves, and we know that from nuclear medicine studies. Normal pressure of CSF is about 5 to 15 cc's of water and increases a little bit during REM sleep. And as we know, REM sleep is a specific type of sleep that happens generally between four o'clock in the morning and eight o'clock in the morning. Anything that increases uh, the uh, pressure inside your body, such as sneezing or laughing, going to the bathroom, Valsaba, will increase the CSF pressure. But it is the sustained increase in CSF pressure that leads to escape of the CSF through the weakest anatomical points. Um, and those are generally in the central base of the skull, around the cella turcica, or in the roof of the nose around the ethmoid sinuses. Now, CSF leaks were described about 400 years ago. And at the beginning of last century, Dandy, a famous neurosurgeon, reported the first successful surgery for this type of uh, abnormal uh, escape of CSF. It was not until the 1950s that the extracranial approaches uh, through the nose became popular. About 20 or 30 years ago, endoscopic approaches started becoming popular, and now they're used uh, very commonly for this type of uh, uh, lesion. And then lately, the intracranial but extradural approach, and in many cases where the escape of CSF uh, is coming from laterally, uh, the endoscope will not be able to reach it, and it has to be done intracranially, but an extradural approach. An extradural approach 
prevents a violation of the dura and makes the recovery of the patient uh, much uh, faster and easier. Now, when we talk about CSF leaks, we talk about three types of leaks. Uh, let me begin by saying that CSF leaks in the cervical and upper thoracic spine almost never occur. They're extremely rare. When we're talking about spontaneous intracranial hypotension, we're talking about CSF leaks in the lower thoracic spine, in the lumbar spine, in the sacral spine. But for the time being, I do want to concentrate on leaks at the level of the basal skull. And leaks at the level of the basal skull, as we'll see later, do not result in intracranial hypotension. They produce headaches by virtue of infection or inflammation. So let's start with the skull base. At the level of the skull base, where we find most leaks are anteriorly at the level of the piriform plates, at the level of the pericellar region in the sphenoid sinus, and in the middle ear, particularly by the essence of the roof of the tegmen tympan. The most common etiology for a hole at the level of the bone that allows CSF leak at the skull base is trauma. Whether it is both surgical or a true trauma, both of those things, trauma and iatrogenic trauma, account for 95% of those defects at the level of the skull. Obviously, there's many other things that can produce a hole at the level of the bone of the skull that may present with CSF leak. CSF leak, if it comes through the nose, is called rhinorrhea. If it comes from the ear, it's called otorrhea. Um, this leads to significant complications in up to one half of the patients, and the most dreaded complication, obviously, would be that of a brain abscess, which still has a significant morbidity and mortality, but meningitis can also happen. Now, if we have a patient that's having CSF leak through the nose, or is having CSF leak through the ears, having otorrhea, we need to prove that that fluid that's coming out of the nose or the ear is actually CSF. And we do that by having the patient collect some drops of that fluid that's coming out and testing it for a protein called beta-2 transferring. Beta-2 transferring is a protein that's basically found only in CSF. So if you find beta-2 transferring in a fluid that's coming out of the nose or coming out of the ear, you can rest assured that that is CSF. The only problem that may occasionally happen is that chronic alcoholics may have false positive results. So if this is a person that's living in the streets, is getting into fights, has head trauma, and is an alcoholic, you must be a little bit careful by using the beta-2 transferring. Now, as we said, common uh, the most common cause is, um, oh, this is the free meeting will end in 10 minutes. I don't know if that's going to work or not. But anyway, uh, the most common cause of trauma is, uh, the most common cause of CSF leaks, excuse me, is trauma. The treatment is generally conservative beginnings. Two-thirds of patients will heal only with bed rest or spinal taps or a lumbar drain and other things that you see on the screen. Surgical repair is only for those patients that do not respond to a conservative type of treatment. So let's look at some examples. Here's a patient, as you can see, on uh, the coronal CT he has a gap at the level of the roof of the ethmoid sinuses on the coronal T2 weighted image is to CSF within the ethmoid sinus and you can see actually a piece of brain herniating down and sometimes this piece of brain may serve as a valve and that is why these patients don't always leak. They leak intermittently while this piece of brain moves up and down. Here's another patient that has a large defect on the right roof of the ethmoid sinuses, you can see part of the gyrus rectus going down, surrounded by a lot of CSF. Now notice that that herniation of the gyrus rectus is not normal tissue, it has high single intensity, has gliosis, and thus some surgeons will decide to go and amputate it and resect it completely to seal that hole, while some other surgeons will try to push it back up into the brain. That depends upon the preference of the surgeon. At the level of the central skull base, generally the leaks are found 
medial to the foramen rotundum or lateral to the foramen rotundum, it is important for you to always say whether the bone defect, like in this case, is lateral to the foramen rotundum or medial to the foramen rotundum. Why is this truly important? Because through a scope, it's really easy to fix those leaks that are medial to the foramen rotundum, but sometimes your surgeon will not be able to make the turn with a scope to fix a leak that's very laterally uh, located within the lateral compartment of the sphenoid sinus. So that, when that happens, they might consider doing an intracranial by extradural approach or a combined approach to that leak. So very important to say that the hole at the level of the central base of the skull is medial or lateral to the foramen rotundum. Here's another patient that has a very lateral defect in the skull base. It's very lateral to the foramen rotundum. You can see that in this patient, there is a fluid level in the lateral recess of the sphenoid sinus. And this is a case that your surgeon may consider doing it through a temporal craniotomy, an extradural approach, and trying to seal that hole from an intracranial approach and not doing it through the nose, as it'll be very difficult for the scope to make the turn and get all the way into that lateral aspect of the sphenoid sinus. Here's another case. You can clearly see the foramen rotundum. You can clearly see the defect lateral to the foramen rotundum. On MRI, we see that through that defect, there is no brain. There's only CSF. So that needs to be sealed. And whether it's sealed initially, as an attempt, they attempt to seal it through an intranasal approach or they go directly to the intracranial extradural approach is a preference of the surgeon. Here's something that we've all seen. This resulted being a piece of uh, a temporal lobe herniating into the middle ear through a defect in the tegment tympani. This patient had an intermittent rhinorrhea. They generally have uh, rhinorrhea. It means that the CSF is draining into the uh, middle ear cavity and then through the eustachian tube into the nose because they have an intact tympanic membrane. For those patients to have an otorrhea, they must have a perforated tympanic membrane for the fluid to leak out through the middle ear into the outer ear. Now, here is another patient that has a very large defect in the inferior aspect of the greater wing of the sphenoid. You can see that there is a significant amount of temporal lobe permeating into the sphenoid sinus. Obviously, your surgeon wouldn't want to amputate all of that brain, but they may want to push it back in. These CSF leaks, as any other CSF leak involving the base of the skull, is much more common in middle-aged women particularly in those ones that are overweight and obese. And like seen in this case, and I've shown you in many cases, an encephalocele, a herniation of the brain, is quite commonly accompanying this defects. And in order to see this uh, piece of brain herniating through the bony gap, you must do an MRI like we did in this case. Now let's talk a little bit about the evaluation of these uh, defects. Uh, in the past, we used to use nuclear cysternography. You can use a variety of radio tracers. Uh, it is a very complex procedure. You must bring in the patient in the morning to the hospital. The patient has to go to ENT. They put the fledglings in the nose. Then the patient comes back to imaging. We did a CT uh, uh, coronally within sections. Then we did the lumbar puncture, put the iodinated contrast plus the radio tracer. Then the patient went for CT, then went back to the clinic to get the fledglets out. Then we recover the fledglets to sample them uh, with a scanner in nuclear medicine. Because of all of this, it's very, very complex to do this, and it has fallen out of favor. It is exquisitely sensitive in identifying the leak if the patient's actively leaking, but it really doesn't give you any bone detail, no fine anatomy to let you know exactly where uh, the um, uh, leak is happening. But the critical problem with all of these studies, whether it be nuclear cysternography or iodinated conscious cysternography, is that the patient must be leaking at the time of the study. So how do we do it nowadays? Well, we do high-resolution CT. If you're only doing high-resolution CT uh, and you're not giving any intrafecal contrast, you don't need an active leak. This has the highest sensitivity to find the bony defect in post-operative or post-traumatic leaks. Uh, the only problem is when you have many holes at the level of the base of the skull, you're not going to be able to reliably tell which hole is the one that's causing the CSF leak unless you put some contrast in there. 
But the technique is very simple. You submillimeter uh, axial acquisitions, and then you do coronal and sagittal reconstructions. If you're going to do a contrast myelogram, then you repeat the same study after the contrast myelogram. Here's a study that we did many years ago at our institution. And the conclusions of the study, that was no con no contrast uh, CT or non-contrast CT detected defects in 70% of patients with leaks. And in our experience, there were no patients that had a positive radionuclide or CT cisternogram without previous visualization of the bony defect on CT. So a very high sensitivity of CT to identify the bony defect in those patients that are leaking. And if those patients have only one defect in the bone, it is from there that the CSF leak is coming from, and you don't need to do anything more. Here's another study done by the group at Emory also some years ago. And what they found is that in the population, CT detected bony uh, defects in about 90% of patients, and that all of the detected defects were at the same location as the endoscopically visualized defects where the CSF leak was coming from. So the points that you can take away from these two studies is that CT is very sensitive in those patients that have a CSF leak, and that the location where you see the defect on CT is going to be the same location where your endoscopic surgeon is going to find that defect. Okay, but suppose we have to do a cisternogram. What do we do? Uh, what is our protocol for cisternography? Again, we're going to get a high-resolution CT. Then we're going to do an LP. We're going to put about 5 cc's of intrathecal contrast. It really doesn't matter which concentration you're using. You can put up to 300 concentration because you put in only a very small amount. Then you're going to, be provo then you're going to do the provocative matters. Uh, uh, it's maneuvers, excuse me, you're going to ask the patient to do a salva maneuver, you're going to try to put the patient in the position of the patient complaining uh, that he's leaking or she is leaking, and then you're going to repeat the CT, but you're going to repeat the CT with a patient in prone position, and you're going to acquire an images in coronal projection, and if you don't see, sometimes you need to bring the patient back a few hours, two or three hours later, and repeat the CT if you don't identify the leak. Here's a patient on the uh, left hand of the screen, you can see the defect involved in the medial aspect of the uh, right the sphenoid uh, sinus pointed by the arrow. And after conscious administration, you can see the butyl of the opacification of the sternal spaces in the ventricular system. And you can see clearly CSF with contrast going through the bony defect and now contrast within the uh, sphenoid sinus with a big uh, fluid level. Notice that here the fluid level appears to be inverse because the patient is laying almost on its face to provoke the, the leak as this was the position that the patient was uh, leaking on. Okay, but there's another way to do all of this without giving contrast, and that is doing an MR cisternography. cisternography. And an MR cisternography and in the sacrum, and that is you're going to get the syndrome of intracranial hypotension, and the headaches are going to be caused by a low pressure of CSF kind of dragging and herniating down all of the structures that you have intracranially. So we said if the CSF leak happens at the level of the base of the skull, you could get headaches because of infection and inflammation, but you don't get any significant or chronic intracranial hypotension. To get intracranial hypotension, you must have a leak in the lower aspect of your neural axis. And this was discovered many years ago. Here's an article published uh, in the journal Neurosurgery in 1976 where they found that, that there were two limits. If you look at the right hand of the screen, they found the CPS, that then the zero pressure zone, Above that, you know, the CSF pressure was lower than the atmospheric pressure, so chronic CSF leaks cannot happen. When they happen, they happen intermittently because you're doing some kind of Alsalva pressure. In between the base of the skull and the upper thoracic spine is the hydrostatic and different point. The pressure does not vary whether you're laying down or standing up. It is only down from the hydrostatic and different point, down from the mid to upper thoracic spine to the lowermost aspect of the spine that you get a significant pressure gradient. And this is very similar to what we see in a water tank. 
if we were to measure the pressure in a water tank at the level of the reservoir, we would find that that pressure is low, probably equivalent to the atmospheric pressure. But if we measure the pressure in the lower aspect of the water tank, the pressure will have increased tremendously. And that is the way that these water tanks work. That's what we do them because the pressure, as it goes down this column, which will be the spine of the tank, increases and allows the distribution of the water throughout hosts, homes and towns without the use of pumps. It is the hydrostatic pressure that drives the water from uh, the tank to the homes that surround it. And equally in the uh, syndrome of intracranial hypotension, it is the hydrostatic pressure that would drive the CSF down and produce the leak at the level of the lumbar and the sacral spine. Here's also an interesting article published in the Journal of Neurosurgery a few years ago. And in this article, what they found is that there was no association between the syndrome of intracranial hypotension and CSF leaks at the level of the basal skull. Moreover, what they concluded was that if you have a patient that has a documented CSF leak at the level of the basal skull and clinically has intracranial hypotension, it was not the CSF leak at the level of the basal skull that was causing the intracranial hypotension but that you must go and look for a CSF leak at the level of the spine because these patients had another CSF leak at the level of the spine that was producing the intracranial hypotension. Now, intracranial hypotension is a syndrome defined as reduced CSF pressure that may occur after a variety of traumatic events or spontaneous events that breach the dura. Remember that the CSF is maintained uh, or maintains the intracranial volume according to the Monroe Kelly hypothesis. The Monroe Kelly hypothesis says that your intracranial volumes are the sums of all of these tissues that are basically composed of water. So if you have a reduced volume on any of these tissues, other tissues may have to increase in order to fill that space. If you have a reduction in the volume of CSF, what's going to happen is you're going to have expansion of the brain, you're going to have expansion of the sinuses, you're going to have expansion of the dura, you're going to have the creation of subdural fluid collections, you're going to have increased of your pituitary gland and your cell aptercica. All of this will be a compensatory mechanism uh, to um, uh, try to make up the volume of CSF inside the head that you have lost by losing CSF. I don't know what that line is there in the middle, that red line, but I'm sorry that is happening. So what are the symptoms of intracranial hypotension? Well, basically orthostatic headaches. Any orthostatic headache until proven otherwise is due to a CSF leak. This orthostatic headaches are aggravated by sitting, by standing, by anything that increases your intradominal or intrathoracic pressure leading to some kind of Alsalva maneuver type kind of uh, behavior. It is relief in prone position. So these patients have headaches standing up or sitting down and when they lay down on their bed, the uh, headache gets uh, better. And one thing that is typical about these headaches and is clinically very, very important is that these headaches are occipital and not frontal. This is very important to keep in mind because we're gonna see how this makes a difference once the patient gets treated at the end of the lecture. Now, what are the features of intracranial hypotension? The features reflect the loss of CSF volume and low pressure. There is downward herniation of the cervical tonsils. The frequenting cistern becomes narrow. The straight sinus becomes vertical. There is a decreased height of the interpeduncular cistern and the floor of the third ventricle sags down and results in a small sized supracellar cistern. There are also secondary signs which are due to compensation for the lowest CSF pressure. There is a thickened and enhancing dura throughout the intracranial compartment. There is an engorgement of the dural sinuses and of the cortical veins. As I said before, the pituitary gland becomes large and there are fluid collections which may be sterile or may be hemorrhagic, particularly if there has been a tearing of a bridging vein. So here you have all of the findings. On the left hand of the screen, you see the herniation of the cerebral tonsils, the narrowing of the prepontine cistern, the decreased height of the interpeduncular cistern, 
the sagging down of the floor of the third ventricle, reducing the size of the supracellular cistern and the increased size of the pituitary gland. Once the patient has been treated, all of those things have resolved. Look at the normal position of the tonsils, the normal volume of the prepontine cistern and the normal size of the interpedonular cistern, the normal position of the floor of the third ventricle, and the normal size of the cella tercica. All of these things that were happening here at the beginning before the treatment were trying to compensate the space left over by the lack of CSF volume. One of you is putting some lines on my, uh, on my slides, uh, uh, so maybe you want to avoid uh, doing that. And this is the type of dural thickening that we have. We have this very smooth dural thickening that can involve the entire brain. Look at this patient. There is dural thickening and enhancement throughout the intracranial compartment. And when you look at the sagittal image, you see all of the findings, again, of intracranial hypotension, herniation of the cerebral tonsils, a significant diminished prepontine size cistern with flattening of the ventral aspect of the pons, narrowing of the height of the interpeduncular cistern and herniation of the third ventricle down, obliterating the supracellular cistern with increased size of the pituitary gland. I don't know who put that circle there. But anyway, here again, in this case, you see her, uh, the increased size of the pituitary gland, herniation of the floor of the third ventricle, decreased size of the interpeduncular cistern. And on the coronal image, you see all of this dural thickening throughout the skull. But on the sagittal image, you see that the same thing is happening, not only along the folds, which is densely enhancing, but also along the epidural space located dorsal to the clivus of the vascular plexus and extending down into the cervical spine. The epidural plexus of the cervical spine becomes very, very thickened. Here is another patient with verticalization of the uh, straight sinus. You can see how the straight sinus looks more vertical than it should be. And again, if you pay attention, all of the other findings related to intracranial hypotension are present, including the lack of visualization of the third ventricle with downward herniation of the floor, leading to a very narrow interpeduncular cistern, a prominence of the pituitary gland, an effacement of the ventral aspect of the pons, and a reduction of the prepontine cistern, as well as significant enhancement of the dura and the venous structures. Now, here's a case with subdural collections. You can see the subdural collections on the T2-weighted image, and you can see that it's not simple fluid because it's bright on the flare images and on the sagittal image again. Again, the findings of intracranial hypotension. So these subdural collections are another compensatory mechanism that the brain and the intracranial tissues are using to fill out, fill in this space that is being left by the lack of CSF. Now, we know that CSF leaks in the sagging of the brain down may result in stretching of the cortical veins, may result in stretching of the bridging veins. If you stretch the bridging veins, you have the subdural collections or hematomas as a consequence, but if you stretch a cortical vein, you may have cortical vein thrombosis. As you see on this patient here, you see the cord sign here, and here you see the cortical vein thrombosis, and you can see it very nicely on the uh, CT. Here's another complication. If you have a cortical vein thrombosis, it may extend into a sinus, and you may end up with dural sinus thrombosis. Again, if you look at the level of the basal skull, you're going to be seeing all of the findings that I already spoke about. Notice the herniation of the floor of the third ventricle with the diminished height of the interpeduncular cistern, and in this case, significant dural enhancement. But what we see is a clot filling out the majority of the superior sagittal sinus, and obviously on the MRV, you don't see the superior sagittal sinus because there is no opacification and no flow in it. Okay, now let's talk about the spine and the syndrome of intracranial hypotension. What are the findings? Well, we have fluid collections, generally non-focals that extend over multiple levels. There is dural enhancement like you see intracranially. There are dilated epidural veins or a prominent venous epidural plexus. Sometimes you get this thing that I'll show you an example. I have never seen it myself, this high T2 signal intensity. 
posteriorly in the neck, particularly at the level of the basal skull and posterior to C1 and C2. And sometimes you have multiple osteophytes and disc herniations, which can be responsible for a CSF leak. One of the most important criteria to document a CSF leak is a low opening pressure below six centimeters of water when you do your lumbar puncture. However, that is not always true. As the group from Duke has demonstrated in this article of more than 100 patients with intrafemoral hypotension, only a third of them had very low pressure. About a half of them had a pressure between 6 and 12 centimeters of water, and basically about 20% of patients had a normal pressure despite the fact that they had findings of intrafemoral hypotension on the MRI. So here are some examples of what happens in the spine. On the sagittal T2 weighted image, you can clearly see an extra axial or extra dural fluid collection ventrally in the lower cervical spine, as you can see another one, and the thoracic spine dorsally. And here in this axial image on the right hand of the screen, you can see that there are two types of collections. There is a very bright epidural collection, then there is a subdural collection, and then you have the spinal cord. So you can have a combination of fluid collections in different compartments, and this happens because there is a rent in the dura and the meninges that divide these compartments have already been um, or are communicating uh, with each other. Here's an example of a very prominent venous epidural plexus in a patient with intrafemoral hypotension. You can see it on the ventral epidural space on the sagittal images, and you can see this very prominent and dilated veins. Sometimes these veins can get so big that actually the patients may present not only with symptoms of intrafemoral hypotension, but with myelopathy from compression of the cervical spinal cord due to this enlarged veins like you see in this case. Now here is the example of this high signal intensity in the posterior soft tissues, generally below the level of the base of the skull and posterior to C1 and C2. I do not understand why this happens. I have never seen it myself. It's been reported in the literature. Remember that some people feel that this is CSF that's leaking out, but we know that CSF does not leak at this level because at the level of the base of the skull, there's basically no rent in the dura that is going to cause a significant leak that will infiltrate the soft tissues. There's not enough pressure at this level to do this. Now here from the literature is a patient with a calcified disc herniation in this cervical thoracic junction, and you can see that at that level, that osteophyte that has formed, that the calcified disc has basically pierced the anterior aspect of the dura, and that has led to CSF with contrast extremization into the epidural space. I have never seen that myself either, uh, so I don't know if you have seen it, but I've never seen any of the two examples that I'm showing you on this uh, slide. A thing to remember is that sometimes we have patients that have CSF leaks in the spine, and those may be associated to other disorders, particularly disorders of the connective tissue, such as Marfan's or Eller Danlos. It can also be seen in patients with polycystic kidney disease, can be seen in patients with neurofibromatosis type 1, particularly those patients that have this expansion of the dura with a scalloping of the bones. And as you saw on the previous slide, it can be seen with bone disorders such as spares or osteophytes due to degenerative changes of the spine. Okay, something that we don't do at our institution, but many people do, uh, particularly in Europe and particularly in South America, to detect where the spinal CSF leak is, is a gadolinium uh, cisternogram. Uh, a while ago, when uh, Andres from Colombia was my fellow here, we wanted to do it here in the U.S., but we couldn't do it in the U.S. Uh, because the IRB would not allow us to do it. Uh, so when Andres went down to Colombia and reestablished his practice, uh, he did a series of patients. And the way that he did it is he administered one millimeter, one milliliter of gadolinium at the L3, L4 space very slowly. Some people suggest that you put a double stopcock valve and that you take out about 5 cc of CSF, mix those 5 cc of CSF with the gadolinium, and then re-administer the gadolinium very, very slowly. You keep the patient with the head down for about 40 minutes, and then you scan the patient. You put the patient on the MR, in the MR scanner in a coronal projection resting on his or her chin, 
to get some good coronal images. And then you keep the patient an hour or two just to make sure there are no complications, but there are basically no complications from doing a MR cisternogram this uh, way. Now, I want to show you some rare things uh, that uh, I have never seen, uh, but they have been uh, reported in the literature. I would be interested to see if you, any of you have ever seen these things. Uh, and the first thing that I want to mention is the so-called uh, CSF uh, venous fistula. So, uh, uh, this was initially reported by the people from uh, Duke. Uh, uh, and they're extremely difficult to see on a conventional cisternogram. You have to do a so-called dynamic cisternogram. We'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and even with dynamic cisternography using iodinated contrast, it can be very difficult to see. The best way uh, uh, to see them is by doing some kind of MR uh, cisternogram. And here you can see a patient that has a diverticulum of the uh, nerve root sleeve and the CSF from that diverticulum is communicating with paraspinal vein that is draining into a bigger anterior spinal vein. I have never seen that, uh, but uh, it is a cause of intracranial hypotension that is being recognized with increasing frequency and I think that you need to be uh, aware of it. Another indirect sign that you have a CSF leak is the excretion of contrast material by the kidneys after a, a myelogram. If you do a myelogram, contrast is going to get reabsorbed and will eventually be excreted by the kidneys like all iodinated contrast is, but this happens so slowly that there is no clear opacification of the kidneys and their collecting system. If you do an, an MR, excuse me, a CT cisternogram, uh, with iodinated contrast, and you see an image like you see in this patient on the lower aspect of the, uh, of the slide on the right side, and you see excretion of contrast in the kidneys, you have to think that there is a CSF leak, that this contrast is being absorbed very rapidly by the vasculature and the epidural space, and is being excreted by the contrast, by the kidneys. And in this uh, patient, as you can see, on the upper right hand of the uh, of the screen, uh, you can see the intrafecal contrast, but you can clearly see uh, extra axial, probably subdural or maybe epidural contrast in this patient that demonstrated excretion uh, of contrast uh, uh, by the kidney. So again, you see excretion of contrast by the kidneys while you're doing or immediately after doing an iodinated uh, CT cisternogram, you have to think that that patient has uh, a CSF leak. So here's a very interesting article that was published by my colleagues uh, from Duke uh, University who have uh, a lot of experience with CSF uh, leaks and they try to debunk some myths, some things that we all believe are found in intracranial hypotension, but they're not always found. Number one is that the syndrome of intracranial hypotension is defined by low pressure. No low pressure, as we saw on the graph that I already showed you, uh, in less than six centimeters of water happens only about a third of the patients. About a third of the patients will have a pressure between six and 12, and about 20% of the patients will have normal pressure despite having findings of intracranial hypotension. Number two, orthostatic headache is always present. And no, it doesn't have to be always present. There can be other types of headaches. Orthostatic headache is present in about two thirds of the patients. Number three, a normal MRI excludes uh, intracranial hypotension. No, uh, the most common findings do not happen on everybody. Abnormal thickening and enhancement of the dura happens in about 80% of patients. Sagging of all the brain structures that I show you, the third ventricle, the pons, uh, and the cerebellar tonsils happens only in about 60% of patients and venous dilatation happens in about 75% of patients. So you could conceivably have patients that have symptoms of intracranial hypotension that show only one sign or even none of these signs that have been described throughout the lecture. Dural enhancement. Dural enhancement when it's uh, nodular and accompanied by bone abnormalities generally means tumor. The dural enhancement that you're going to see in intracranial hypotension is thin, it is homogeneous, it is not nodular, and it involves all of the head compartments, 
It is accompanied by normal bone. And if you see all of these features, that dural enhancement is not due to metastasis, is not due to lymphoma, is not due to leukemia. If it follows all of those features, this type of dural enhancement is highly specific for intracranial hypotension. Most spinal imaging does not show leaks. That is also false. Most spinal imaging, if you look at it carefully, will show leaks. Carry one is a feature of intracranial hypotension. No, carry one is not a feature unless it is an acquired carry one in a patient that was not known to have a carry before. If you develop a carry malformation, that is an indication that you have spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Number seven, leaks may be caused by tarlow cyst. No, tarlow cysts do not cause CSF leak. Tarlow cysts are very common in the lower lumbar spine and in the sacrum and do not cause a CSF leak. A tarlow cyst is not located outside of the dural sheath of the nerve root. It's located inside. It's a perineural cyst, this part of the nerve itself or the intimate coverings of the nerve. To have a CSF leak, you must have a dural diverticulum. A dural diverticulum happen most likely in the lower thoracic spine and not in the lumbar spine. Basal skull defects cause intracranial hypotension. We already said no, no. Basal skull defects cause headaches due to inflammation and infection. Only spinal defects will cause intracranial hypotension. And the last uh, myth that they try to debunk is that a blood patch is equal to conservative therapy. No, we said that conservative therapy works in the majority of patients, but if it doesn't work after six months, then you must have or must do a blood patch in these patients. And if you don't know where the CSF leaks, many patients will do, uh, many physicians, excuse me, will do blind blood patches in the lumbar spine in the thoracic spine to try to seal a hole that we're not able to identify. Now, let me talk about this, which is very rare. I haven't seen it either, but it's been also reported by several groups, again, including the group uh, from uh, Duke, which I think were the first people to describe it. And that is a rebound headaches uh, after closing the CSF leak uh, responsible for the intracranial hypotension. That is what they call rebound intracranial hypertension. This happens when the CSF pressure becomes high or normal after the CSF is leaked. These headaches are different to the ones that we saw are different and opposite to the orthostatic headaches. They tend to be retroorbital instead of occipital, and they tend to get worse when the patient is laying down and better when the patient is getting up. This is the complete opposite to the orthostatic headaches. This is seen in about 50% of patients that have a CSF leak treated by a blood patch. Uh, fortunately, in the majority of these patients, it is mild and results within one week. If it doesn't resolve, you may want to give the patient something that reduces the production of CSF, such as uh, Diamox. Uh, and if that doesn't help, then you may need actually lumbar punctures. Uh, paradoxically, you need lumbar punctures to treat something that was initially caused by a CSF leak. And the most important thing is that you must know the clinical findings of the patient so you will not confuse it with refractory hypotension. It could be that the treatment that you did for the initial hypotension did not work. The patient continues to have hypotension and thus you must treat the patient for hypotension and not rebound intracranial hypertension. Then there's something called fatal syndrome of intracranial hypotension. In these patients, there is cerebral edema, there are infarctions, particularly at the level of the cerebellum, the brainstem, and the upper cervical cord. There's only about 30 cases reported in the literature. These patients present with progressive coma, and the treatment is an emergency. And I want to show you a case that we saw. This is a patient that came in clearly with signs of intracranial hypotension. All of you guys can see it now. There's herniation of the tonsils. There's diminished prepontine cistern with flattening of the pons, a narrow interpeduncular cistern, downward herniation of the third ventricle, which is not seen. Actually, these findings were not related 
to the neurosurgeons and the neurosurgeons went ahead and did a lumbar puncture. And a few days later, the patient was not doing well. You can see the edema of the medial aspect of the cerebral hemisphere is probably compatible with influx of the picas. And then a few days later, now you can see the influx of the pica and you can see the influx of the spinal cord and the patient died from a complication of treating uh, or doing a lumbar puncture in a patient that already had low CSF pressure. This is, this is an example of what's called fatal um, syndrome of intracranial hypotension with infarct of the brainstem and the spinal cord. Okay, we're at the end of the lecture, and I want to stop about uh, five minutes uh, before the hour, so if we have some questions, we can try to answer them. So some things to remember, uh, patients with multiple potential spinal leaks, so like multiple neurodiverticular osteophytes, you must do a dynamic myelogram, you must inject the contrast, and you must scan the patient at the same time on your CT. You're injecting the contrast, and the patient is moving through the scanner. If you know which side the patient is leaking, you put that patient on that with that side down. But if you don't know which side is leaking, you put the side that has the most diverticular uh, down. Uh, and if not, if you don't know which side is leaking, you generally put them on right the right the cubitals because in most patients, it has been found that most leaks, for some reason, come from the right side. Now, if a patient has intracranial hypotension and all of the studies were normal, the suggestion is that you must do a dynamic MRI cisternogram with gadolinium to rule out a CSF venous fistula. Patients that continue to have symptoms of intracranial hypotension despite normal studies of the spine without contrast may have a CSF venous fistula. And like we saw in that article that I showed you before, the only way to prove the CSF venous fistula or the best way to prove it is by doing an MR with gadolinium. Okay, come to the end of the lecture. So we look at skull based CSF leaks. Uh, we said already the skull based CSF leaks. Uh, are generally post-traumatic or post-iatrogenic in nature. They generally involve the region of the cella and the sphenocytes or the cuneiform plates, or they may involve the temporal bones through a defect in the tegment tympani. They may produce inflammation or infection, but they almost never produce the syndrome of intracranial hypotension. The syndrome of intracranial hypotension is a common cause of chronic headaches, particularly when they are or the orthostatic type. Um, the most obvious findings, like I show you in many, many cases, are found in the brain, particularly at the level of the skull brain with the creation of the tonsils, uh, the pons, and the third ventricle. And the cause is almost always in this patient's a leak in the spine. And most leaks are located in the lower thoracic, in the lumbar spine, and in the sacral spine. You don't have enough pressure from these leaks in the upper thoracic spine or the cervical spine to produce the syndrome of intracranial hypotension. So with that, I want to finish the lecture. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, I think that we have a chat function here. So if you want, if you would like to ask some questions uh, uh, through the chat function, uh, uh, you can ask them. Uh, amazing, amazing, amazing lecture, Professor. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Castillo, for a brilliant lecture, as always. <laughs> if you have any questions to, to make to Dr. Castillo, please. <laughs> we have a question on the chat. Uh, is there a role of, for flare sequence for the differential between CSF leak and the school base and inflammatory mucosal changes of the paranasal sinus from Lorenzo? So let me see. Lorenzo says, is there a role for flare sequence for the differential diagnosis between a CSF leak in the school base and inflammatory changes uh, in, in, in the mucosa? Uh, Lorenzo, I don't have any experience using uh, flare sequence to evaluate the mucosa. Most of these patients in our hospital get uh, gadolinium, so if you see uh, inflammatory changes in the mucosa, they're generally going to show gadolinium enhancement, so uh, that is what we use. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you have any experience that you would like to share with everybody, uh, please do so. Uh, we do not use uh, any flare sequences to take a look at the paranasal sinuses or even look at any structures in the neck, at least at our institution. We don't have either, Dr. Kashi. 
Okay. Right. More questions? So I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Castillo, thank for you, our Pablo. brilliant lecture and to have accepted the invitation of Dr. Pablo and our team. Dr. Pablo, o senhor quer falar alguma coisa também? É, só, só agradecer. Agradecer aí a, a excelente aula. Thank you, Dr. Castillo. Thank you, uh, 